Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our final event for 2021. And a fitting event it is, given the recent lifting of lockdowns in both Sydney and Melbourne here in Australia. I'm Professor Emma Johnston, Dean of Science at UNSW Sydney, and I'm delighted to be hosting today's discussion on how the pandemic has changed the way we talk about mental health and well-being and how we act about mental health and well-being. What are the lessons or changes we might see in the world with COVID-19? Some would like to say post-pandemic, but maybe not. Our panel, who I will introduce shortly, are leading experts in their fields, and they'll share their knowledge and research into what implications the pandemic has had on society, our understanding of mental health, and how this might shape how we live, how we work, and indeed how we connect with each other into the future. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. I'm joining you from beautiful Gadigal country. I'd like to pay my respect to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining in the conversation today. Just a note, we are recording this event and uh, we will be sending a link to that recording to everyone who has registered and please do share that link in the coming days. Wherever you are joining us from today, thank you for being here. It's an exciting time for many of us as lockdown ends for the moment and we start to think about how our lives might go moving forward. But before we dive in, let me introduce the marvellous panel that are joining me today. First up, CNT Professor Richard Bryant, AC, is a Professor of Psychology at UNSW Science, and he's also Director of the UNSW Traumatic Stress Clinic. His research is focused on the nature and treatment of stress reactions. He has identified key genetic, neural and psychological factors underpinning our stress reactions, and he's identified strategies to manage them. He's worked with the World Health Organization to develop programs of treatment to manage stress reactions, and he's adapted those programs and mental health problems specifically during the pandemic. And we'll hear some of that, some of those trials today. Associate Professor Jill Newby is uh, at Psychology UNSW Science as well. She's also an MRFF Career Development Fellow and Head of Clinical Psychology at Black Dog Institute. <clears throat> she is a leading expert on the technology-based technology treatment of depression, anxiety and chronic health conditions in adults. And she leads programs of research into e-mental health, smartphone apps and virtual reality interventions. So Jill's research not only aims to improve the lives of people who are living with depression and anxiety and those at risk, but also to improve access to affordable and effective treatments. Third up, Professor Frederick and Seal. Frederick is an organisational psychologist. He's also Professor of Management and Senior Deputy Dean Research and Enterprise at UNSW Business School. He studies how people and organisations learn and adapt to change. Um, he's very highly cited, but his work is also featured in global publications that you might be familiar with, such as the New York Times and the Australian Financial Review. His article on COVID-19 might and how it might change the blueprint of cities was selected by LinkedIn as one of the uh, 21 big ideas that will change the world in 2021. Finally, Dr. Jodie Lowinger, CEO and founder of the Sydney Anxiety Clinic and CEO and founder of Mind Strength. Jodie is also one of our wonderful alumni, and I know many alumni are joining us today, so thank you. Jodie was also a university medalist as an alum. She, thought, she is a thought leader uh, in anxiety and resilience and, and a treatment. Um, she's also passionate about using those skills to transform human behaviour in teams and individuals and has um, best-selling books in this space. Jodie combines her business skills with a depth of knowledge about the techniques from clinical psychology and neuroscience so that she can help her clients achieve peak performance, not only in their workplace, but also in their personal lives. So thank you for joining us today, Jodie. I'm gonna start this conversation with a really big question. And it's a question that I think many people are asking themselves, what just happened? 
we have been through a whirlwind of change as the pandemic was first identified and announced and then the rolling series of government, government responses and medical breakthroughs that have happened over the last two years. We have heard quite a lot about mental health during this time and that there is really a crisis that has been created by the pandemic and our response to it. But is that the reality? We've got some experts here who can let us know what actually has happened. And I'm going to start with Richard. Richard, tell us globally, has there been an increase in mental health problems during the pandemic? And what does it look like? Thanks, Emma. Um, it doesn't need me to tell you that um, we've all been through a tough time. Um, it's been unprecedented. And um, I have never seen anything ever in terms of the amount of research that's been done in a very concentrated period of time about mental health from nearly every country in the world. Um, just like we've seen this incredible surge in, in vaccine and, and uh, viral type research uh, and epidemiological research has also been an enormous amount done on mental health. Look, to boil it all down, what we know is that across most countries affected, um, anxiety and depression, which are the most common problems, have gone up by a quarter. Oh, sorry, about a quarter of people are experiencing anxiety or depression. Mm -hmm. um, but what we really see, and these are the studies that we really need to look at, is that when we look at the rates of PTSD, um, anxiety and depression before the pandemic, so 18, 19, and then looking at those same rates in 20 and into 21, we can really see these steep increases. And when we so there's some really important modelling done, when we look at the, study, uh, the countries that are most affected and most affected by lockdowns, that's where we can see in the timing of it that their anxiety and depression has really increased the most. It's a very, very strong pattern between that. And the, the global estimates at the moment, um, based on that modelling, suggest that since the pandemic started, there's probably been an, an extra over 50 million cases of major depression and um, probably more than 75 million cases of anxiety disorder globally. Now, they are huge numbers. Um, and what's interesting, I think, at the moment, there's some new data that's coming out, um, particularly looking at countries that are somewhat ahead of Australia in terms of their vaccine rollout, and also in terms of when they've eased restrictions, and looking at then the studies that have been done in the mental health when lockdowns are sort of over. And that's sort of what we have to look forward to now in Australia. Um, one of the, the misconceptions is that I think everyone thought that once the lockdowns were over and everybody was vaccinated, it'd be like flicking a switch and we'd all be happy again. But what we're seeing is that there a lot of that anxiety, depression and loneliness is actually persisting over time. And um, from what we know about how mental disorders work, um, that's to be expected. So this is going to be a longer term problem. It's not going to just be fixed um, overnight. It's something we are going to have to deal with as a field for years to come. Um, and uh, I think just the one last point I'd make, Emma, is despite those enormous numbers, we've always got to remember that most people are resilient and we, we shouldn't lose sight of that. It's been tough for all of us, but there's a difference between just going through a tough time and just putting up with it and managing it and really having a, a real significant problem. And most people have been able to manage it despite the various difficulties. And some of the um, hyperbole and the uh, enthusiasm at the beginning of the pandemic, actually it hasn't played out. There was huge predictions that there'd be a tsunami of suicides, for example. And when we look globally, suicides have actually not increased globally. In fact, in Australia, they've come down a bit. Um, so we shouldn't do it. It's not all gloom and doom. That's really interesting. So it's not all hype, but some of it is hype. So we are actually seeing this substantial increase in mental health problems from before the pandemic to now. We don't expect them to disappear but some of the more extreme forms of that, including suicide, have actually reduced. That's really fascinating. Jill, can I throw to you for some specifics in Australia? Do we know, you know, we are a little bit behind in terms of dealing with the, the vaccines. We're, we're certainly a season behind the next flu 
flu season. Um, but is there a great difference between us and the rest of the world? Not so much. I mean, the research that we've been doing over the last year shows what Richard's been saying, increased rates of anxiety and depression. And a lot of that's um, related to stress. People have had that ongoing cumulative stress that lasts for a year or two, and that's contributed to both people who had pre-existing mental health issues like depression and anxiety, their symptoms getting worse, and then new onset. So people who had never experienced this before getting a new problem that they experienced over the past uh, couple of years. So the picture looks fairly similar to, to the international data. I guess what, what we don't have is that post-lockdown, how the mental health changes over time. I mean, some of the data that we've looked at um, – there was a Sachs Institute study called the COVID 45 and up study, which tracked people over time, did rapid surveys um, every few months over the last year, and it's still ongoing. And what that showed is when people were in lockdown um, and when those restrictions were tighter, they reported the mental health impacts as worse than when they were out of lockdown. So I think we can expect to see some improvement over time. Mm. So when you say an accentuation of existing stress, so, and when you link it to stress, is that stress around not knowing what's going to happen or is that stress around additional workload or additional family responsibilities? Where is the extra stress coming from? Oh, it's a good question and it's very individual. You know, I think the stress for one person can be very different to the stress for another person. Someone could be living alone and they feel incredibly lonely, especially before the single bubbles were introduced. So that could be the source of stress. For other people, they might be juggling incredible workload, um, burnout related to work, working from home, um, online learning for their kids and just sort of managing the day to day. And then there's other people that experience stress related to fear of fear of COVID. We, we've seen a big increase in, in health anxiety related to COVID. So people worrying about either themselves contracting COVID or their loved ones getting sick and even dying from COVID. So it just depends on the individual, but I think all of those things, cumulative, you know, they sort of pile on top of each other to increase, um, increase the stress people are under. That's interesting. I might move to Frederick now because I know that what we're talking about here is very individual, but we are seeing broader patterns, aren't we, at a societal level and, and work workplaces are actually looking at that as well. Do you think that there has been a differential impact on different sectors of the, of the working teams, you know, that you work with? I, I do think so. So it's interesting to see because, as we've been discussing, it's really been a global shock. And it, in the world of work, it does not happen that often that we, we are experiencing something that is happening all over the world at the same time. And so uh, we're learning a lot from what is happening. And I'm, I'm getting approached a lot by sort of CEOs. They're very concerned, actually. So some surveys show that the, one of the top three priorities is right now is mental health of uh, workers and, and employees. Um, but the data are not always very good at this point yet if we try to sort of compare what how the data were before and what is happening right now. Um, what the first studies show, and I think it's, it's a quite compelling sort of a story, is that there's a differential pattern in, in for instance, that... Um, uh, female employees have had a very different experience than male employees in, in companies. And so, uh, especially if we look at, let's say, the lockdowns, which sort of forced everyone to work from home, often in an, um, a bit unprepared and disorganized way, and, and children needed to be homes, uh, homeschooled, and we had partners also working from home. And what we basically see in the sort of the first good studies is that uh, a very differential pattern, for instance, in productivity, where actually for women, productivity was declining. So I mean productivity from the view of the organization, right? Productivity was declining, and for men, actually productivity was increasing. And we see the same sort of differential pattern when it comes to um, distress. So what we see is that actually women uh, reported more uh, distress, uh, anxiety uh, because of work, not being able to uh, complete all sort of uh, demands, uh, being a needing to juggle sort of uh, family uh, life, young children in home, and still being online and doing all these uh, tasks, um, work life sort of um, 
invading family life late in the evenings and the weekends. And we saw we, we see this pattern, especially, for instance, very, a good study on time use pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. And we see that time use and sort of uh, comfort with time use is completely different for men and women. And so it's especially, I think, uh, young families, young women uh, and young families that have um, struggled the most with this whole shift towards um, uh, virtual working. And the risk is, of course, that that will um, continue in the future because a lot of organizations are currently considering this hybrid work model where there's a lot of flexibility flexibility, and people working from home. And there's a risk that these sort of habits or patterns are sort of continuing in the new world of work. Really interesting. So differential impacts because the, the context in which the changes are taking place are already culturally specific and gender specific. Yeah. Okay, so we have also seen this in the in the research, particularly in the STEM area where I come from, research productivity of male academics has gone up during lockdowns and during the pandemic and research productivity in terms of, you know, publications, for example, has actually been reduced and women are reporting a lot. It's a lot harder to get everything done because they have so many other interruptions and, and responsibilities. It cannot really be fixed necessarily by an organisation. But anyway, we'll move to solutions at a later point, but it's a bigger societal issue. And I wanted to, to focus now on the differential impact that we might be also seeing in younger people. And I'll throw to Jodie here. Uh, you work with a lot of, of younger people in, in Sydney and other areas. Have we actually observed a greater impact of the COVID lockdown, lockdowns on the mental health of young people? Absolutely. We're seeing an escalation, certainly, in the number of people that are uh, calling the clinic, seeking out mental health services. Uh, it's just exploded through the COVID period. And so the, um, the issue in terms of access to uh, good treatment strategies to help adults, kids and teens through this challenging time has been, um, you know, really pressing on resources, but at least there is this, uh, you know, um, extension of services available now in the, the benefit of a hybrid environment and, and telehealth and enabling people to access the care. But just dealing with the long-standing uncertainty and the challenges that are um, inherent in uncertainty and that being uh, a, a primary trigger for anxiety, anxiety levels have been on the rise exponentially. And this is tipping into the school system as well with the burden on uh, education leaders and uh, so principals, teachers, and then having to absorb and contain the stress in whole school communities, um, and then the extension of the stress with children and adolescents. Really tough. And then there's the knock-on effect with parents having to uh, deal with the challenges of homeschooling and, and changing their boundaries around technology usage, and, uh, and then the imbalance that can take hold and the knock-on effect to um, our level of well-being for our kids and teens, not getting out there, not socialising as they otherwise would, and how can we leverage this hybrid environment to actually enhance mental health and well-being as opposed to the imbalance that has been taking hold in the COVID context. Thanks, Jody. That's really interesting. And it rings true in a lot of uh, people's minds, I suspect, as they have had to um, rely on technology to actually keep their kids engaged with the world, but also with their teachers and their schools. Richard, can I, can I throw to you, and just before I do throw to you, Richard, the, just wanted to mention to the audience, we will be taking questions uh, at the end in a Q&A, but, but they'll be written and typed. So make sure you are typing your questions in. The questions will come up to me immediately. I can then um, infuse them throughout the conversation. So if you want to start adding your questions now, please do. And we already have some questions from the audience in, in the preparations for this event. So I'll be throwing those in too. Thank you for your inspiration there. So Richard, why would younger people be more susceptible to the disruption of COVID and, and the lockdowns? I think there's a few reasons. Um... Number one, we know that the uh, older people are basically more financially protected. So we know that the economic uh, hit that many people have suffered, that businesses have suffered, et cetera, um, the, most older people have sort of got that, that buffer 
to protect themselves. So younger adults, you know, in particular, um, but they are particularly uh, vulnerable to this. We also know that the the sort of age span from like 15 through to mid 20s, it's always the peak vulnerable period for developing uh, particularly anxiety and depression um, and other problems from a, a psychological perspective. So these people are always vulnerable anyway, because it's just a, uh, well, for a variety of biological and developmental reasons. But also, if you think about the challenges through uh, the pandemic and lockdowns, things like um, there's been huge restrictions to social relationships, which young people rely on so much, uh, academic um, performance, you know, things like schools and university. Um, I mean, these are critical milestones that people need to engage in, and you know, they've been thrown a curveball. I mean, we in universities have, have seen this firsthand. Um, and these things, and just in terms of mobility and, and, and social interaction uh, generally, I mean, that's just so important for young people, but it, it's just been so restrictive for them. Um, and these are years they're not going to get back, and they're aware of that. So I think we really do need to, um, you know, be aware that even though those, those strict restrictions are over, as we're starting to see, they're going to keep going. I mean, you know, there are there are clusters, there are variants coming, there are seasons, winter's going to come eventually, and, you know, we're going to keep having these rolling effects, and that's going to have an impact on the younger people in particular. Yes, yes. We actually have a question from the um, the audience that's just come in, which is completely relevant to that. And they're, they're saying the title post-pandemic suggests the pandemic is over, but it isn't. It's here to stay. And I, and I think we're all recognising that slowly but surely that the world is changed forever as a result of this. Um, and I just wanted to, while we're talking about that younger cohort and particularly that 15 to 25 year old group, Jill, you've been working with university students. Can you tell us um, what you've learned? Yeah, we've learned almost in all of the research that we've done that that, that group is, is worse affected in terms of their mental health. All, almost all of the studies that have been done here and other countries show that the younger people are, are worse affected. Um, there's a few reasons for that, I think, like what Richard has been saying, but also they're missing out on the fun. They're missing out on the joyful experiences that, that can happen at university, just, um, you know, building your networks, meeting new people, establishing your identity, figuring out who you are, um, looking at establishing your career and figuring out what you want to do and having those job opportunities or internship opportunities to get experience in a range of different workplaces. All of those things, along with um, the disruption to casual jobs, has made an impact in that. And then online learning. You know, online learning can be very accessible. Anyone can access it with an internet connection. But it also does rely on your self-motivation. And it can be really hard to stay motivated on your own when you're really determining your, your workload and, and what you're doing with your studies. And talking to university students and the data just shows that that's been a really difficult time for, for those young people. Jill, that's so true. But also, I guess, in linking that with the financial consequences that Richard was talking about, the, the availability of part-time work has, you know, temporarily gone off on and off. Uh, but the availability of long-term work, continuing full-time jobs, is apparently dropping substantially as well. It's not just COVID, you know, it's a, it's a trend all the way around, but that surely must be impacting mental health of young people. Frederick, do you get insights into, you know, how organisations are tackling that? Are they hiring young people or are they just getting them on the casual payroll? Um, uh it is uh, it is not as predicted. It is actually better than predicted. Um, during the lockdowns, a lot of companies are very sort of cautious in terms of recruiting and hiring because they know that onboarding new people in, in these times it's very difficult. And we we we've seen a couple of studies that actually show that young people that started in those periods. Um, they're a bit lost, right? Normally, you go you go into the workplace, you you see what is happening, you learn from experience, from others' experience, from talking about things, and if you start a new job from home, you feel a bit isolated and lost, and so that is a difficult thing to manage. And a lot of companies know this, but the good thing is basically what we're seeing um, that the economics of it are not too bad, and if we go out to lockdown, we see a, a quick sort of 
increase in optimism about a potential recovery and companies start hiring again. And so basically that, that, that provides a bit of optimism that there will be no what we call scaring effects. So normally in every sort of um, economic serious economic crisis, what you have is that a young generation that typically then enters the labor market in very difficult circumstances, you could see that play out over years, decades often, that they're sort of the quality of their employment, the quality of their uh, work-life experience is sort of uh, uh, damaged by that early uh, bad entry. Um, but I think that basically, and of course I'm overgeneralizing across global regions, but generally the, um, the economy is in an in a reasonable state and is able to quickly recover. And so I'm relatively optimistic about um, entering uh, the job market and, and finding long-term employment uh, at this stage. Um, the one thing I should maybe mention is that what we are overlooking is, um, I, I get approached all the time to talk about this hybrid work model and working from home and virtually but actually the majority of people are not able to work from home, right? We, we forget about this. All the press, all the sort of uh, articles are, are about this shift to remote and hybrid work, but the majority of people cannot work from home. And so there's a risk that we introduce some sort of a new inequalities and we do not talk about the stress um, and the hardship that a lot of people in this sort of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, physical jobs, and uh, it, it could be in retail, it could be in manufacturing, those people are also dealing with all those stressors and all those changes, and they're not able to sort of um, decide on their own work rhythm, and they, do, they often do not have the same autonomy. So I think it's something that needs more attention. Yeah. Mm. And keeping an eye on all of the resources that need to be provided for people who need to commute, for example, those sorts of things, you can't afford to just let it slip from the government's mind because they're thinking that most people are working from home. That's an interesting aspect that I hadn't really thought about. Um, certainly the, the lack of um, autonomy or the need to provide services during a pandemic was very clear that people, you know, on the front line of working at Woolies were receiving more abuse. They, they were working under highly anxious conditions because they were worried about being exposed and then exposing their family. So there's definitely an extra load that people were carrying in those face-to-face -face jobs. Um, and I guess that will continue. Dr. Jody Lowinger, you you work a lot with young people and but also with their families, and you've also worked to advise organizations. Are there strategies? We're getting questions now that I think starting to move us towards solutions. Are there strategies for how um, someone starting their career in this kind of home or hybrid work environment might might tackle getting to know everybody? You know, is there a different way of going about this? And and similarly for school kids, are there ways of of breaking down the barriers, the tyranny of of Zoom and remote learning? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's a really wonderful opportunity to move towards uh, active hope around the elements that are in our control and moving from the, the, the brilliance of mental health awareness that has evolved out of COVID um, is, is one of the upsides that we can really hold on to and move now from awareness into action and helping people to recognise that the challenges that we are talking about are really helpable experiences. And it's about now recognising uncertainty as the state of the world and recognising technology as the state of the world and moving from this position of fighting and grappling with uncertainty and fighting and grappling with technology if we can move into acceptance and leveraging so sitting with the discomfort of uncertainty is part of how we are as humans. But if we can build awareness around that, then we can move into practical and resilient action. But certainly around technology, accepting this hybrid world of work and trying to leverage it in a work context both at a, uh, you know, a young adult and an, a, at any age, really, and how can we embrace technology but then move back into rebalancing around it? So burnout is the critical issue that we're experiencing at the moment. Global studies demonstrating the impact 
of these morphed boundaries where your desk is a metre away from your bed and the knock-on effects with juggling um, children. But how can we now sit with optimism because the practical strategies are there that really do help people? Thanks, Jody. You've touched on a number of different things that I think we can explore in the next little part of the conversation, but I wanted to pick up on the first bit that you said and just have a, a little reflection from the panel here on that. We did get a question from the audience prior to this event, which was um, around that idea that, yes, we are talking more about mental health, but the audience member was concerned about this. So the question is, challenges with mental health are increasingly common but I think there's a risk of making anxiousness normal by virtue of how our society operates, talks about it, places expectations on productivity and the image we are to present. And I guess the question that's coming out of this, I'm going to interpret a little bit, is, is what are society's current values do we actually need to address to tackle this beyond the COVID situation? Or what has COVID helped us reveal about society's expectations that are actually increasing the prevalence of anxiety and stress? I'm going to throw to Richard first, because I, I think um, you've, you've been through a lot of years where mental health wasn't spoken about much. Now it's spoken about a lot, but are we doing enough to actually address the problem? This is Emma's way of nicely calling me the old guy on the group. <laughs> um, not say that at all. <laughs> I can wear that now. Um, it's always an argument as to whether anxiety and depression are increasing or whether our awareness of it and the extent to which we are reporting it is increasing. Mm. Um, and it's very hard to tease those things apart, obviously. Um, the, the fact that it's increasing or not, I mean, for me, it's a bit of a moot point. We know that it is there for a significant proportion of the population, and we know that our strategies to help those people are good but not great, and we always need to be striving to do more. I think what's interesting about the pandemic is that there are many, many people who are ex now experiencing anxiety, depression, who have not had it before. Um and in fact, some of the, the longitudinal data tells us that the biggest increases in anxiety and depression are in those who did not have it before. Um, so they're getting quite severe cases. Oh, yes, yes. And it's not surprising. I mean, I'd also put this in a global context. I mean, I do a lot of work overseas. And when we see what's going on in a lot of the other countries where the infection and death rates have been far, far higher than ours in mm -hmm. Australia, I mean, the nature of mental health is different. I mean, I've, I've been working in a, in a, in emergent in um ICUs, and basically every time somebody goes in an ICU and they're intubated, they've got a 50% chance of dying, and they can't be with their pa their family to say goodbye for infection reasons. And a week ago, they were doing fine. Mm -hmm. Now, the follow-ups of those patients, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a really quite a significant disorder, you know, is really very high in that particular population. Uh, you think about something like prolonged grief, you know, with many countries with very high, you know, um, death rates. I mean, the global estimates there are very, very high. And But fortunately, we have dodged a bullet in dealing with those sort of issues. There's still a lot of people in Australia with mental health issues that do need to be addressed and we need to be creative about how we do it because these are people who are not traditionally ways that we – they're not treatment seekers – to the traditional sense, because I don't see myself as having a mental health problem. And I guess part of the message I've been trying to communicate to people in the pandemic is, look, having anxiety and depression doesn't mean you've got a disorder. You know, we're all going through a horribly stressful time that we have never been prepared for. We learn need to learn skills now about how we can deal with it better. And so do our organisations and so do policymakers. But we've just got to be a bit creative about how to do it because the, the nature of it is different. Um, I think in terms of that question that was asked, Emma, about the you know how society is valuing and framing mental health, I mean, that's a great question. It's a very, very big one. And I'd, I'd probably, to be honest, I'd need to ponder it a bit before I answered it. It's a very deep question. Well, that's the kind of clever audience members that we attract to these events. Because yeah, you need to get smarter panel members. <laughs> We've got the experts <laughs> up in front of us. I'll give you a moment to think about that, Richard, and um, <laughs> just move on to Jill. Jill, this is an interesting question. You know, a lot of um, 
and and I won't use the word old, but more, our more senior members of society might be might be thinking, well, what is this global pandemic of anxiety? And it's all the young people, the treatment seekers, et cetera, et cetera. It's just because we're talking about it too much. Where's our resilience gone? Now, you, you are working with the cohort that's probably presenting a lot, um, and we do hear a lot about the uh, mental health kind of crisis within university students. Is, is there a crisis or what are we doing is actually just revealing the anxiety that would be absolutely normal at that stage of people's lives and we're just better at talking about it and treating it? Yeah, it's a really good question. We've looked at the data over like several years just even in the psychology cohorts about their depression, anxiety, stress levels and they have been slightly increasing year on year. Um, over the past 10 years. And that seems to be what um, other researchers find in, in other countries. Um, I guess we could see it as a doom and gloom thing that we're, you know, we're recognising more anxiety and we're recognising more depression and is there the risk of overdiagnosing these these problems? There's a couple of things. I think first there's we need to make the distinction between anxiety symptoms or feelings, like just feeling anxious or worried, that's entirely normal versus an anxiety disorder, which there are specific criteria that need to really go on for weeks to months um, to sometimes years in order to, to get a diagnosis um, and have a disruption to daily life that lasts for at least six months or more. So there's, there's quite a distinction there that I think the stories in the media really don't portray because they don't portray that nuance. But then the other side of it is I think it's actually a really good positive news story if we're detecting it more or there's the mental health um, is more in the conversation it's a top priority for for organizations this means more people will be able to get help and strategies and evidence-based tools that work and I think regardless of whether you're labeled as someone who experiences anxiety or not those skills and strategies are things that you can learn for like a lifelong um, they will last throughout your entire life, can help you stay resilient during difficult times. So I think it sort of doesn't matter so much. If, it, if people are seeking help, getting those tools that work, that's the most important thing. Absolutely, yeah. So can I just move to Frederick and back into the workplace? Sorry, I'm labelling you as the workplace person, but you are an organisational I am, I am. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. During COVID, did companies, were they creative? Were they innovative about the way that they tackled these issues and the impact of COVID on mental health? Um, actually, they were. So so I would say there, there's good news, but maybe there's also, well, some sort of bad news. So the good news is actually this sort of... Uh, openness uh, and awareness in the workplace to talk about something that has been a taboo for a very long time, that a lot of people are struggling, mentally struggling with issues at work, anxiety, stress, um, and especially now managers and leaders coming forward and sharing their stories, sharing mm -hmm. their experiences. And you could say it, it is just talking about it, but basically in the workplace that makes a difference because if a senior manager or a leader genuinely sort of talks about their own struggles, it creates a sort of an openness and psychological safety for other people to talk about it. And once you're able to talk about it, you can also talk about solutions, right? How could we handle this differently? How could we organize ourselves differently? And so in that sense, that, that is very good. Um, what we've also seen that's a good thing is support services, right? And so because uh, those managers know that is a problem and they, they want to do something about it. So they, they created uh, a, a lot of support in terms of external support. People could call in with psychologists uh, or, or even on a, on a lighter level sort of coaching. They, there were trainings, uh, helping people to deal with all the changes. Again, that's very good. Um, we do not, not know a lot about the effectiveness of those things, but at least it signals a concern. And a lot of, we know in terms of um, well-being that knowing that sort of your organization and your direct managers care about your mental health is, is very important for your well-being. So these are the good things. What I'm a bit concerned about it, it is that sometimes, and I'm overly critical here, but I've called this sort of almost theater, right? That a lot of companies sort of play the theater. They say that they're very concerned about those things and, and they will talk about it. Um, but they, they sort of do not take any sort of fundamental actions to, let's say, change the workload, change the, the target. So I've seen companies saying things like, 
Um, look, we have a mindfulness uh, training here for you. You can take that uh, mindfulness training over lunch. And next week we have a sort of a time management training. Um, but then it's back to business again and your, your targets remain the same, your workloads remain the same. Uh, we, we need to cut costs. And, and so that puts a huge stress on people. And so it sometimes seems all a bit superficial while these things will temporarily maybe help people in dealing with the issues. But as long as you're not prepared to fundamentally and systematically sort of um, explore and examine what the real problems are in terms of the workloads. And for instance, if people need to respond to emails or, or, or have a very short uh, short times to respond to any sort of demands from clients needing to work in the weekends, late in the evenings, that is the real problem. And there's not one mindfulness training that will help for these sort of things. So that is my concern. And I would invite uh, senior leaders and companies to think a bit more uh, about how they organize work, how they lead, and how they could change that to have a real impact on mental health. Yeah, so it's all about addressing the root cause of the problem, and, and maybe one approach is to get leaders to be thinking about the longer-term re um, return on investment rather than that short-term one, because we do know that having you know longer-term, happy, healthy employees actually is highly, highly productive situation for any organisation. And at the moment, with a lot of turnover of staff, that surely is front of mind for a lot of these organisations. Jody, are you seeing that also? Are you, are you seeing companies starting to think about the longer term return on investment of having employees with good wellbeing and mental health approaches? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have the, the, I suppose, the privileged opportunity to coach CEOs and C-level executives, um, oftentimes of large organisations. And it is when it is championed from, from that C-level um, aspect of an organisation that it really does impact so positively on, on the bottom line, the return on investment. Because what happens then if it's championed is it is embedded in the organisational culture. So it must be dealt with at a cultural level. We're talking about psychological safety within the workplace as critical when it's built into the culture through various strategies of open communication, um, then organisations um, would, uh, as a byproduct of that, be more likely to flourish and thrive. And as a byproduct of that, there's um, heightened productivity and performance. And so psychological safety where we can build transparency to say it is okay to not be okay and um, build those open conversations is critically important. And really when we're talking at an organisational level, really the narrative that um, you know, I, I have the opportunity to build within, within organisations is when we are in anxiety, stress and burnout, we're in fight or flight. And that's ultimately sub-optimised ways of engaging. So if we can uh, educate corporates and communities and, uh, you know, schools as well to understand our typical drivers, understand the neuroscience of this and our capacity to take ourselves out of fight or flight and realign to, to values-driven actions and, um, you know, well-being actions, then we are going to boost well-being and flourish and thrive and we're also going to optimise within the workplace. Yeah, great tips. And I feel like I should stop and do some deep breathing now, but I have to... <laughs> So, but we do we do understand now better how to how to switch physiological tricks on and off in our bodies as well, which is very very interesting. That's not something that I think was widespread knowledge, maybe ten or fifteen years ago. Um, so, at least not in the circles I work in. So, one question that's come from the audience, and this is completely different. I'm not sure who's got the expertise in this space or or um, has done a lot of reading, but it, it was the most popular question so far. So I do have to read it. The, the audience members are curious to hear about the link between the pandemic and alcohol consumption. It's almost, I guess, self-medication. If we know people are more depressed and anxious, why aren't we talking about alcohol consumption more? Does, has anyone um, been working on this or has kept abreast of the literature? I mean, alcohol, substance abuse has increased in substance the pandemic. Substance abuse in general, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't ex uh, focus it exclusively on self-medication. 
And by that term, we usually mean if I'm anxious or depressed, my I cope with the emotional difficulty by, for example, drinking more or getting stoned more. Um, I mean, also just being at home a lot more. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people were, to be honest, just ordering alcohol in and consuming it a lot more because, you know, of their routines. They weren't out and about. Um, so it's not – now, I don't have good data on this, but um, – you know, anecdotally, that's that's a report, but it certainly has increased. Um, now, what's going to happen um, as things settle a bit more? You know, the longer term data, you know, will, de- will uh, tell us. Um, but it's an interesting question because the, the so much of the focus has been on um, anxiety, depression, PTSD. Um, but honestly, things like alcohol abuse and also tobacco use, not so much in this country, but in others, because um, these have got huge uh, health ramifications. Of course, once this person gets into that habit, they then t- keep it going. And that's got very widespread long-term health consequences. And I think the other thing we haven't spoken about much is the impact on sleep and physical activity. But when we're looking at the lifestyle behaviours that make a huge impact on mental health and well-being, we're talking about alcohol, sleep, physical activity and diet. Those things make a huge impact on how, how well you feel in yourself and also your physical health. So um, they're sort of things that are really important to talk about too. Yep. Yeah, so just moving in that space, Jill, moving forward in that space, what you know, you've been doing some trials, I believe, in interventions, Richard and yourself. Um, what is working? So moving forward, we're coming out of lockdown, but we know we might go back in. We also know that we've got long-term effects, you know, a scarring, a definite scarring from the heightened anxiety and depression cases that we have already seen during the pandemic. How do we get ourselves in a really proactive space of treating our own mental health? What are the tips? Um, I mean, I can start with the research that we've been doing and then maybe hand over to Richard to talk about his trials. So we've done quite a few studies now looking at online programs. So there have been existing online evidence-based programs you know, 10 years before the pandemic started um, that help either improve stress, um, treat anxiety or depression. They often do a little bit better when they get clinician guidance, so an expert sort of supporting a person through a program. But we looked at whether those programs worked as well during the pandemic, just to see whether we could use the tools that we already had to to help people upskill um, in how they manage their mental health. And what those studies showed that they did. So they worked just as well They helped improve and reduce depression, anxiety, stress, increase um, strategies like mindfulness and other strategies that can help mental health and well-being. So that's really good news that digital programs can help. Um, And we've also developed a few new ones from from the pandemic, sort of been inspired by that. So one study that we did last year um, that one of my PhD students did was uh, testing a very brief online program for worry. And what was really exciting about that is it helped people manage worry even in the context of the pandemic. Most of the participants were in lockdown under this very difficult strain and stress, um, but they still improved. So they still worried less. They had less psychological distress, less anxiety and less depression by by the end of the program. So those types of programs can be very beneficial for people. And the more we roll them out, the more we get them to people that need it, the, the better. Can you give me a practical example of what you might use in such a program? Is it is it about helping people identify thoughts and you know stop and stop stop them and turn them on and off? What is it? What yeah. is- people to do so one of them might be you you start to recognize when you're getting trapped in negative thinking because i think we can often um, stew on things or worry about things or ruminate or overthink things and not be really aware that we're doing it and we teach people when are the warning signs what are the warning signs that you're getting trapped in that thinking that can really reduce your mood and put other things in place during those really high risk times so if it's at night that's a difficult time when you're lying in bed you know, thinking about all the horrible things that are, that are happening, you know, use distracting activities or other things that you can put in place during that time.
time when it's your sort of your high risk time to help get your mind off those thoughts and onto the the present moment. You also might schedule in activities during those times to try and put that focus um, back on the moment. So you're not overthinking things, but you're focused on something that might give you pleasure or enjoyment or purpose or, or something like that. It's great to hear that these can work at a distance as well, so we can really reach people all across our wide brown land. Richard, have you been working in a similar format with online interventions? Uh, we've one of the big pushes, I mean, across the, Australia um, since the pandemic, obviously, is that mental health was delivered remotely. Um, so most mental health professionals, like a lot of GPs, were delivering their services, you know, just like we are now you know, via Zoom or video conferencing. Um, so we uh, we did, um, we've done a, a number of trials where we have adapted a program we developed with the WHO a number of years ago that's very simple, built on the evidence that we know works for people to sort of manage adversity um, and basically strategies like teaching people to um, lower their arousal um, just, you know, through simple breathing techniques um, teaching people how to uh, manage their worry, like some of the strategies Jill talked about, and also things like if, if people are going to worry at times like this, if I don't have a job and I can't do this and I can't do that, but you compartmentalise how much time of the day you might worry. So you know you you sort of have a worry time, and that's all, and that and that's that can sort of free up other time, so you're not you know uh, having those thoughts intrude. Uh, and helping people sort of pro solve problems, teaching people how to access their social supports and, and have positive experiences despite the lockdowns. So we just came up, we just did a, an adaptation of that program, gave it to people across Australia in a trial, um, just in video conferencing in groups of four at a time. And we found six months after that that it markedly reduced anxiety and depression and worry. Um, and we've been doing more trials since then, and we've we've got one going now where we're actually just uh, doing a comparison between that program and an online a, a digital program like Jill spoke about, just to see how the two um, fare against each other and how they uh, how people sort of uh, the acceptability I guess of them. I mean, what do people find most most uh, user friendly? Um, and th those trials are still going on. If anybody wants to access them, it's uh, they can just go to traumaticstressclinic.com. I totally forgot to put that into the resources, so um, my bad. Um, but uh, it's at traumaticstressclinic.com if anybody wants to access those those trials. Thanks, Richard. We'll pop that in the email when we send links around. Uh, so you're now warmly welcome and invited to join those trials. I mean, you say these things are simple, but in fact, the idea of, of just kind of scheduling a worry time is is quite radical to most people, I think. But, it, it, you know, if you can then compartmentalise that concern to that period of time, you can imagine how well it works for the rest of the day. Um, I'm going to go to Frederick. And, and Jody, you might want to comment on this as well. It's probably the last question from the audience that we'll have time to deal with today. And thank you very much to the audience members for your great questions. I've interspersed them amongst this, this conversation. Um, but, Frederick, it's it says, um, as restrictions ease, the pressure on caregivers only increases. For example, return to office, face-to-face -face work, commuting, extracurricular activities, resuming social lives. What, strat what strategies can be put in place targeted to those who simply feel they don't have time for things like self-care, clinical assistance for mental health challenges? And we, and we do know that people have you know, avoided going to the doctor during lockdowns and that sort of thing. It's a very good question because it's a, it's a very good observation in the sense that what we call that in the organizational psychology literature, the recovery paradox. It, it's well documented. And so the idea of the, the paradox is that at the moment that you're most depleted and most in need of sort of support or activities that would sort of help you, you basically do not have the energy to engage in them. Right. And so a lot of people will recognize this, that basically, let's say you, you had a very stressful day, uh, lots of meetings, you feel overwhelmed, 
probably the best thing that you would do at that time is maybe go out, go for a walk, exercise, or meet up, uh, social support, meet up with friends or family. But what you do is you 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 you. you you, you sit in the couch and you, and you Netflix your whole evening uh, away, right? That That is a bad thing. And so that is a recovery paradox. And so what has often been suggested in the literature to sort of deal with that is that um, because at that time it requires a lot of energy to engage in those activities because they do not come natural to you is basically that you, before you need it, you build habits and routines where you already are doing this. So Think about it. If you are used to going out every morning uh, for a walk or uh, you're used to meeting up in a, in a sports club or with friends, even maybe just going out for a chat, if that is a routine and you have a weekly schedule in doing that, when you're then completely exhausted and depleted coming back from work, you will feel more, it, it will require less investment and energy to basically do this because you already have that routine and that habit. And so I think w- when I'm talking about the question is the same thing when it's about um, self-care, I think if you are waiting with this till the moment you really need it, it's probably too late. So you probably need to anticipate and build some sort of a routine and a habit, paying attention to this um, so that when the time you need it, it requires less effort and it almost comes natural to you. Great advice. And I guess reducing that decision stress as well is a really useful thing when you're already exhausted. Jody, have you got similar advice? Have you got techniques for um, promoting self-care? Absolutely. Um, I think that it's really uh, fabulous for us to recognise that this is strategies that will help wherever we sit in the um, anxiety, severity, you know, mild, moderate, severe. These aspects really will help all of us as part of being human, recognising the mind-body connection, so exercise and movement, connecting with others, making sure we're getting out in nature because we are inherently with biological beings living in this technological world. Um, I've actually written a book called The The Mind Strength Method, um, which is my methodology, which became a a bestseller within within the first month of launch. And it's cram-packed with practical tools and strategies um, to, to help people. And I think that the fact that COVID has really brought out this as part of the conversation, um, brought mental health, mental fitness, as well as sort of in a, in a human context, um, as opposed to circumscribing it in a clinical context, can only really be good for everybody ultimately. Practical evidence-based strategies that work for everybody. Thanks, Jody. And I think the key message we're leaving everybody with at the end of this fascinating conversation is that there are strategies out there. Uh, There are lots of really easy to use strategies that um, are accessible, increasingly accessible. Um, So if you are feeling stressed or anxious or you've you've struggled during lockdown, don't leave it too late. Don't leave it till you're exhausted. Make sure you reach out and and access some of these strategies and start putting them into your daily practice. And I think I'll, I'll take that message home as well. I do get up early every morning to go for a walk and I never have to make a decision about it because it's just something that the dogs make me do. So I think <laughs> there's something to be said there. So I'd like to really uh, end by thanking our panel of experts here, Frederick, Richard, Jill, Jody. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. It's been absolutely fascinating. We have learned a great deal. I hope you as listeners have learned a great deal and you're taking home some um, useful messages. You can also spread the word about the expertise that's at the University of New South Wales and our fantastic programs. Um, that'd be great. We will send out, as I mentioned, an email with a link to this recording for anyone who would like to watch it or send it to their friends to watch. We do get a lot of uptake post the live event. But with that email will also come a list of resources, and I believe that list of resources um, that you can access will actually be posted in the chat right now as well. So on behalf of UNSW Science and the Business School, of course, and all of our alumni, I'd like to thank our panellists, but also thank you for joining us. This is the last of our discussions. We've had a wonderful series this year, so thank you if um, you're a repeat Uh, audience member. We really appreciate that and we also appreciate the engagement uh, that you provide through the questions. And just lastly, if you do have a few spare minutes, uh, it really is only a one-minute process, there's a link to a very brief feedback survey 
that we will put in the chat as well. We'd really appreciate any feedback you have on today's discussion. We always take that and use it for improving the next time we join you. Have a wonderful break over the new year, and I hope you come back refreshed and join us again next year. Thanks very much.